What's up, reptile fans? Dave Palumbo here with Muscle Serpents Daily, and it is Friday, and I hope you guys all had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you guys had tons of turkey and stuffing and all the cool stuff that goes along with Thanksgiving. And now we're back to doing what we do, and I am back in the snake room. And you know, today I'm gonna do a little educational video. I like to do those every once in a while. People always ask me, you know, how you treat different ailments when the snake gets sick or if they're not eating, or maybe they're regurgitating, and there's different modalities that you can treat different um, problems that these reptiles can have. So I wanna go over what you do if your snake has a respiratory infection, if once again, sometimes they, these snakes will just spontaneously start regurgitating, and that's not a good thing, because a lot of times that leads to death if you don't get to the bottom of it, and sometimes they just won't eat. There's different solutions to the problems. So let's go into the snake room, take a look, and see what's going on. And I'm even gonna give you a little preview of my little bird training session I did at uh, my mother-in-law's place uh, when we had Thanksgiving over there this past weekend. Uh, my friend Bob King had given her this really nice parrot, ring neck parrot, and it just was being very aggressive and didn't wanna be trained. And let's take a look. All right, you know, uh, Bob King, a good friend and reptile breeder extraordinaire, uh, moved and he had this, this great bird. What kind of parrot is this, Denise? Ring neck. Ring neck parrot. She. And she was a terror. She was bite the hell out of Bob. And Denise, my mother-in-law, took this bird and she's been working with her for a bunch of, uh, probably, what has it been, about two months now? Yeah, about two, two months. Two months. And this thing still was biting up like a storm. And today, we made a huge leap. Well, and Bob, see. look. It's a lover. It's a lover. It was trying to bite my finger off when I first got here. Now, well, yesterday, this. yesterday. So yeah. I, was I don't take any credit. Denise did all the work, but you know, now she had a breakthrough today. <laughs> and this bird is the coolest bird. Look at it. Look at how it. Look at it. It just loves it. It's a lover. And it's got a brand new cage, and everything's great. So we don't do all snakes. Sometimes we do birds, and. Uh, Bob, thanks for giving us this bird, or giving uh, Denise this bird, because this is a great little bird. You have to show this to your daughter. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. What's up, snake fans? Dave Palumbo here from Muscle Serpents Daily. And guess what, guys? I'm in my studio because I have some education to impart to you, and I like to sit down in a nice, relaxed, cool environment with some good lights. And I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about how to treat disease when it sets in or you know anything that creates irregularity in your snakes this is something that a lot of people don't talk about maybe people don't know about it or maybe people people just don't want to go out there and put it out there hey i got six snakes but everyone gets six snakes now and again everyone has eating problems everyone has you know regurgitation once in a while and you know what it's nice to know what to do welcome to my studio snake fans and we're gonna talk about, as we said earlier, diseases in snakes. Because let's face it, at some point in time, your snake's gonna get sick. It happens to us all. The bigger your collection, the more you're gonna have happen to you. So as your collection grows, um, you're gonna notice that you're gonna have more respiratory. You might have a regurgitation now and then. You might have a snake that just won't eat for a very long time. You gotta know what to do about this. You know, a lot of people don't wanna talk about this. They wanna make it seem like everything's sunshine and roses, and that's not always the case. Sometimes you have one snake and things go wrong. And you're like, how can I have one snake and it has a respiratory already? And you know, people who have, you know, established, you know, snake rooms like I do and you know, some of the bigger breeders, you know, we get into like a rhythm. We know what the snakes need and so we get less sickness over time because of the fact that we know the right temperatures and we've avoided all the pitfalls. Like I used to drop temperatures for my ball pythons and do um, hot spot drops at night because everyone does that, right? You know, you drop at 10 degrees and I was noticing a lot of respiratory tract infections. So I stopped doing the hot spot drops. I just kept the hot spot, but I dropped the ambient room temperatures during the breeding season. And that was enough of a stimulus to get all my snakes to breed and no one got respiratory tract infections anymore. It was amazing. So. But what do you do if you notice that? That dreaded, you pull the tub out, 
Usually it's because you, usually you're showing it to someone. You usually got a friend over. You want to show them your snake collection. You pull the tub out and you see, and the, your friend's like, what are those bubbles coming out of that snake's nose? Respiratory tract infection. And why do snakes get respiratory tract infections? Well, because they have, a, they have one lung essentially, and it's this long, elongated lung. And as soon as any kind of bacteria get in there, and maybe the snake is a little compromised um, because it's cold, because we drop temperatures, it's stressed out, whatever the case may be, now the immune system is not functioning well, and guess what happens? They, these bacteria that are already in their throats and in their nasal and, and, and uh, respiratory tracts now can start overpopulating themselves, and that's when these you know, animals go downhill very quickly because they, they have to be able to breathe, you know? So, you know, I've been told by innumerable people, I've watched YouTube videos, you know, very few people talk about using antibiotics. Most people say, oh, you raise the temperatures, you put them. I have a friend, he told me, oh, just put them on 100 degrees, you know. I just heat them up, you know, and it goes away. Never happened to me. It always got worse. I've had people tell me nebulizing them, you know, use F10 disinfectant in a nebulizer and it'll help clear out. And it never worked for me. Nothing other than antibiotics ever worked. And let's face it. When we get sick, okay, we go to the doctor to give us antibiotics. There's no sense, especially with a very expensive snake, messing around and trying to figure out, you know, alternative treatments when we know what works. You know, and the good thing about, you know, bacteria is they've kind of lumped into two groups. What we call gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. Um, and there are different sets of antibiotics that can be used to treat both types of infections. Now, it's not important to go into what a gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria is. They're just two different groups. They stain differently when you put them under a microscope. You know, I uh, had a lot of extensive schooling in terms of I was a biology major. I went to medical school for three years. In the bodybuilding and fitness world, I'm the guy to kind of go to to explain about diets and nutrition and supplementation. And so I'm really, I like the, the, the scientific minutia and I like to figure out the right way to do things. And I also like to teach it to other people so that um, people are not making mistakes like I might have made, you know, you know, when I first got into the snake breeding business. Now, obviously, I'm learning. And I'm still learning. I, I, only, I don't know that much. I just can, what I do know is I can explain to you. So what I found is that when you treat with like a gram-negative bacteria, if you go to the vet, they'll, they'll culture your bacteria that's in your snake in the respiratory tract. They'll send you back, uh, you know, they'll tell you, they'll usually send you home with some antibiotics, but then they'll call you back and say, oh, it was gram-negative, we should treat with this, it was gram-positive, we can treat with that. The problem is that even though a, an infection is predominantly gram-negative or gram-positive, there's always, there's always the other one usually there too. So what happens a lot of times is you treat the predominant infection that could be, let's say, gram-positive, for instance, and then... The only thing left is gram-negative bacteria, but now the snake might still be compromised. You know, immune system still might not be functioning. Well, now the gram-negative starts to grow. So you get a secondary infection, and you're like, I don't understand, I just treated. And, and, and now I got another infection, and then you try to use the same antibiotic again, and it doesn't work because it's actually a gram-negative bacteria. So what I found, and I've, and I've heard other vets say this, not many, but I've, but I've talked to enough vets that agreed with me, it's better to treat for both. It sounds like, you know, oh, well, you don't want to give the, the, the snake too many antibiotics. When it's facing, you know, uh, death, you treat, okay? You don't want to lose an animal because you're worried about bacteria. I mean, come on, how many times in its life are you going to treat it with antibiotics? So what I do is I treat with the gram-positive antibiotic and the gram-negative. Now, the two predominant antibiotics that you'll see in, in the snake business. And there's a lot of different ones that you can use, but the, the, the best ones for gram-negative would be what we call Batril or enterofloxacin, okay? That's the uh, chemical or generic name of it. And these work really well. Um, they have to be applied every other day. Now, it's funny because, you know, humans take antibiotics every day or sometimes three times a day, right? But snakes have a slow metabolism, so you don't need to give it to them every single day. You give it to them every other day for the uh, Batril. And for, if you're gonna treat gram-positive, the latest antibiotic everyone seems to be using for gram-positive is Fortaz. That's the, the, the brand name. The generic name is Ceftazidime. And that works really well against gram-positive bacteria. And that needs to be uh, given every third day, actually. Okay, so you don't have to give it every day. Usually when I first initially dose and I give, you know, a, a dose of each one for the first day, 
you know, you get it on the same day, and then they're on like an alternating schedule, and every so often they kind of coincide because it's a, every second day for the for the Batril and every third day for the Fortaz or Septazidine. So I find that when you do this schedule um, and you give it to them for at least a month, it knocks it out. You can't do a week because remember, if you humans are taking it every day, seven days in a row. These snakes are only getting it two or three times a week, these doses, so you got to do it for a longer period of time because of their metabolism. Usually a month is adequate. Sometimes in really bad infections, you might have to go two months. Okay, the key is if after two weeks the symptoms go away, don't stop treating them. Because if you stop treating them, it will come back. Just like you don't just stop your antibiotic prescription in the middle if you, once the, your symptoms go away. You got to knock out the whole thing. That's, that's very important to remember. The key to knowing when these snakes are over these infections is they usually go into a shed cycle when they're over it. And what they'll do is they'll shed out and then you know they're good to go. And then they'll usually eat. Um, I wouldn't try to feed during this period of time unless it's a very mild back, uh, respiratory. Because don't, you don't want the snake to have to devote its energy to, to digesting a meal. You want it devoting its energy to combating this respiratory tract infection. Most animals will not eat when they have a respiratory anyway. Um, and you might get freaked out. Oh, they're not eating. Don't worry about it. Let them work on getting rid of the, the respiratory. Once they go into that shed cycle and shed, they'll, you'll be surprised. You give them a small meal, they'll eat it. Okay, and that's the key. That's when you know it's done. So, once again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into my snake room. I'm going to cut to my snake room. I'm going to show you exactly, you know, what, what uh, needles to use because you have to inject this stuff into the animal, how to do it. It's very simple once you learn. You know, you can go to a CVS pharmacy and pick up, a, you know, a packet of 10 insulin syringes. Um, and, you know, there are websites that sell these antibiotics um, if you're industrious enough to find them. My suggestion would, is what I do is I go to my vet, you, you take one animal there if it ever gets sick, you have a relationship with your vet, especially if you're a bigger time breeder and they know you have a lot of animals, they know it's impossible for you to bring all these things in, it's too expensive. A lot of times they'll just they'll write, give you a prescription, or you can actually buy the bottle of antibiotic from them. And that's what I do, I buy a bottle of gram positive, gram negative, the Fortes uh, and, and Batril, and I keep it in my refrigerator. Uh, they usually will give you some insulin pins, if not you can always go to the CVS pharmacy or one of the pharmacies and pick up a pack of those. And, and there are websites you can buy them on as well. And, and just have that in your cabinet, you know, as, you know, prophylactically, in case something happens, you're, you're ready for it. You don't want to get caught, you know, in the middle of the breeding season, you have a respiratory, and then, oh, then you got to first try to get your animals to the vet. Have the contingency plan in place. Now, the ceftazidine, which is the gram-positive antibiotic, it needs to be kept in the freezer. So even before you mix it, and then when you actually add water to it, because you have to dilute it usually, um, you keep it in the freezer. And then just defrost it right before you use it. I usually hold it in my hand, I'll put it in my pocket with my cell phone, <laughs> hit defrost, I drop my, my dose, and I put it back in the freezer. The Batril or Enrofloxacin, that, that'll last. You don't need to put that in the freezer. You don't want it to get super hot, but you know I keep mine in the, in the, um, in the butter area of the refrigerator. You don't need to. It, room temperature is fine. I just do it because sometimes I get paranoid because the snake room gets warm and I think it's more stable there, but it doesn't need to be kept, you know, cold per se. So, and, and that's, that's the way you do it. And I'm going to, like I said, let's cut to my snake room. Let's see what we do and then we'll come back. Here's the syringes you'd get. These are what are insulin syringes. These are the comfort ones. These are half cc or half ml and they're 30 gauge, which means they're really tiny tips. You, know, you can get these once again in the pharmacy. You take this as a little thing. Here's your plunger. Here's your tip. You can see this is a very, very, you can't even see it. It's so fine needle. All right, so you, you see the insulin pins I use. You know, you can see um, how I'm injecting the snake. Um, it, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. Um, once again, you just, you just have to be patient. Once you do it the first time, that's the most nerve wracking and the hardest. After you do it once, it becomes simple. And it, it, it's not a big deal. And I think that people are so intimidated by the process that they don't do it. You know? But if you're going to keep reptiles, okay, and you're going to keep a lot of them, and you're going to breed them, you better learn how to do this. I know the most you know what the most intimidating thing for me was coming through? I couldn't sex these snakes. I'm a guy who like, prides myself on you know, being able to do stuff. And I couldn't, I couldn't pop these snakes, and I couldn't do it. I don't know what it was I was doing wrong. I, couldn't, I just didn't have the touch of it. And, just one day, a friend of mine came over and just sh just showed me the right way to do it, and boom, I was doing it. And I, you know, now it's like I'm like, how did I not know how to do this? You know, but it's just it's a comfort level you have to get to, and that's really what it amounts to. Now, the other thing you might encounter in your in your collection 
is snakes that regurgitate. Now, baby boas, if you feed them prey that's too big, will, will a lot of times throw things up, especially leopard boas. And that's really just because you're, you're, they just they need small prey. I give all my baby boas very small prey, undersized prey, for the first couple months, actually, because that'll pre- prevent that from happening. But sometimes you get like an adult, you know, like ball python or boa that, that, that's regurgitating for some reason. And you don't know what to do. And, you, you know, the snake, when once they start regurgitating, they go downhill really bad. And if any of you guys have experienced a regurgitated mouse or rat, they, they smell, hor- you know that smell. It's a horrendous, horrendous smell in the tub. So what do you do? A lot of times it's, well, it's because their gut, you know, uh, is, is irritated. Their stomach or whatever the case may be, there's an irritation there. So when you prey goes in there, they want to eat, it just ir- over irritates it and it makes them throw it up. So what breeders have experienced over the, you know, the last, whatever, 15, 20 years is that for some reason, a uh, flagell, okay, also known as metronidazole, happens to be a really good calmer or soother of the gut. Okay, a lot, you know, people use it as an antibiotic, and uh, some people use it as an antiprotozoan uh, type of drug, but for some reason, it settles the stomach of these snakes. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is you got to get it into the snake's stomach, okay? It's not something you can inject. Now, where do you get this stuff? People don't really sell it anymore as a liquid. I, I, I usually go to the uh, aquarium supplies online and I'll buy it from there and you can get like powdered metronidazole. I buy it in like a big thing, the little packets, they're like 500 milligram packets. And usually, you know, for a, a thousand gram snake, you're gonna use probably, I don't know, um, 125 milligrams, so probably a quarter of the packet. The good thing about flagell is if you use a little too much or a little too li- a little, little, it's, you're not gonna really, it's not one of these things that has to be dosed precisely. So I usually go about a, like a quarter of a packet or 125 milligrams and I don't even weigh it out. I kind of eye it. If I have a packet that's 500 milligrams of powder, I give a quarter of the packet. I put it into a syringe. I'll show you how I do it. Uh, we'll cut to that and uh, I mix it up and I put the syringe down. The, uh, this, and it's usually what I do is I buy the bird syringes or the, the feeders for birds. It's like a long metal thing that kind of connects to the end of a big syringe, usually a 20 ml syringe. You put your liquid, you put your powder, you add some water, and you can use tap water. You literally just shake it up. Okay, put this plunger in there. You connect the uh, end, and you just have to basically hold the snake, and you have to just stick the thing down its throat and squirt the, the solution down there. Usually one dose does it. Give it a dose, let it sit for a week, the snake, let it have relax, and then try to feed it. Usually always works for me. All right, guys, so I want to show you um, exactly how we're going to get the metronidazole down the throat of the snake. So we have a syringe that comes, you know, like this. This is a typical 20 ml syringe, okay? And you can buy it in this kit. This is like a little kit for feeding birds. And it comes with all these different, you know, heads here that you can kind of put on it. You basically open the back of the syringe, you pull it out, you decide which head you're gonna use depending on on the, the, the snake size. And so this is, I, I like to use the thickest one for like a regular, you know, adult ball python. And then I have my little packet. Here's my 500 ml packet of metronidazole. I'll rip it open. I'll basically take a little bit out. I'll pour a little powder in here. If I want to be really neurotic, I'll weigh it. But I pretty much can, I can pretty much eye it by the packet. If I'm going to use about a quarter of a packet or half a packet. Uh, once again, this is 500 milligrams uh, in here. So uh, usually I'm using anywhere from 125 to 250 milligrams. I'll now, add, now what I'll do is I'll put my, my tip on here and it just twists right onto your syringe. And then you add water in here, and it doesn't matter how much you add, I usually add about maybe, I'll fill the syringe about a third of the way up. I'll then put my plunger here, and then what I do is I open the snake's mouth, I put it in, and I, and I push all this fluid right in. And it's so simple. It just goes right down its throat, I massage the snake a little bit, and it's done. Okay, now, if you have a snake that doesn't eat, or doesn't want to eat, because it's been on a food strike for a while and it's not like a, like a baby that's just being stubborn, you can try it also. A lot of times that'll help and get it feeding. You know, some people notice sometimes after, right after these snakes, I find that after they give, uh, they lay eggs, they, they want to eat right away. But sometimes you get a stubborn one that just won't. And sometimes a little flagell will be something that uh, works really well. So these are just little tips and, and uh, you know, 
I can't tell you everything and you gotta, you know, a lot of times it's good to make a relationship with your vet, let him explain some of these things, take some of the information I gave today, even talk to him about it or her about it and, and you know, find someone that you're comfortable working with there. But what you'll find is when you have a big collection, you're not gonna wanna call the vet and go to the vet every time something goes wrong. It's just too much. Some of these solutions are really simple, you know. Now, a lot of people ask me how much of the antibiotic should you inject? And you know, there's different dosing regimens but usually for Batril, it's 10 milligrams, okay, per thousand gram snake. Like the Batril I use um, is a 10% solution. So usually you're gonna use, if you have an insulin pin, you go to the 10 mark on the insulin pin, that's about a 10th of a cc. Um, and you do that for every 1,000 gram snake. So if you have a 2,000 uh, gram snake, you're gonna do 20 units. And you literally just, once again, inject it into the snake, you're done. When you're administering these antibiotics, okay, for the gram-positive bacteria, and you're using Fortaz or um, Ceftazidime, it's usually the dosing regimen is 20 milligrams per thousand gram snake. Okay, that's that's standard. So if you have a, a, a 2,000 gram snake, you're going to be giving it 40 milligrams, okay, every third day. Now, how do you measure that? Now, usually these bottles, you have to mix them. So they usually come 2,000 2, milligrams per bottle, okay, or two grams. You put 10 mLs of water in there, and then each little 10 mark on an insulin pin, 10th of, a, of an mL, is equivalent to 20 milligrams. So you're doing 20 on the insulin pin. So the, the 20 uh, you know, mark on the insulin pin, and that's gonna give you a 40 milligrams. And once again, these are things that it's very hard to explain. If anyone wants to ask me or send me questions, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, but it's not, the dosing regimen is not tough. I'll put that up, the chart up that you should use for that in this video. And once you dose it, as long as you get the dosing right, it's a very small amount of fluid you're injecting. Very, very tiny, which is good because when you have to put a lot of fluid into a snake, it's not going to react well. When you're putting a little tiny drop in, it absorbs it really well. It doesn't usually leave any welts. I have never had any problems with like uh, any kind of like a degeneration of the tissue where you're injecting. Just move around the injection site. Don't always put it in the same spot. Once you have your, your, your stuff in your syringe, you want to go in the front third of the snake's body. So here's the back, here's the front. So you go to the front. Here's your spine right here. So you're going to go to the, either the right or the left of the spine. That's where it's really dense muscle. You see your scales here. You go right between the scales. I don't want to inject this animal. It's not sick. It doesn't need it. Put it right in there. Push the fluid in. It'll go right into the snake's body. And you're done. All right. I hope this video helped. I hope you guys realize don't get intimidated when, 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 uh, when something arises and an animal gets sick. I know it's depressing. I usually go home because I'm usually cleaning at night. I'm like, oh, man, this stinks. But you know what? these things are all pretty much curable. The problem is when these things don't go away, especially when we're like respiratories don't go away after treating it properly, then you should really go to the vet and take, get your animal tested because it could be viral. Remember, viruses don't respond to antibiotics. Antibiotics only kill bacteria. So if you have some kind of weird virus in your, in your collection, that could be very dangerous and that's something you can test for IBD or you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them out there now that unfortunately um, are lurking in some people's collections. And we all don't want to, you know, hope and pray to God that we don't have it. But, you know, if something is not responsive, then you go and, and take that step. I wouldn't go crazy and think that you have the worst case scenario uh, just because an animal gets sick. Treat them conventionally first. And then if it doesn't work, you take it to the vet. Or, you know, I'm sure the vet will treat it conventionally first. And then if, if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll test further to see if something else is wrong. Once again, the key is good husbandry. Keep your snakes clean, okay? Give them clean water, because clean water, if, you, if they're drinking dirty water, that's going to absolutely increase their risk of getting uh, infections because the bacteria grow in the water. And of course, don't subject them to super low temperatures if, they, if they're sensitive. Ball pythons are sensitive to cold drops. Carpet pythons, not so much. Olive pythons love the cold. Brettles pythons love the cold. But as a matter of fact, we, I, you, know, you put them in, even in a super cold area because in the winter to initiate breeding. But ball pythons, when you give them temperature drops, they get sick. It happens. Everyone, you guys out there have experienced it. You know what I'm talking about. And don't think you're the only one who's going through this. Trust me, it happens to us all. All right, I hope this video was helpful. If you guys have uh, any suggestions for future videos, put them in the comments below. 
Of course, if you want to email me any questions about dosing an animal, feel free. Uh, my contact's in the uh, description below. Hit that subscribe button, turn on your notifications, like this video. We'll see you back tomorrow.